Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Franz Kafka's story, The Metamorphosis, is a transformation not just of Gregor Samsa himself, which is the most startling and you know, clear transformation or Verwandlung in German, but we also see that his family is changing as well as a result of his own change. And we could say that as Gregor's fortunes are declining, those of his family seem to be declining, but are also in some respects rebounding as well by the end of the story. And why is that? Well, in the beginning of the story, we find out that Gregor Samsa is a commercial traveler. That is a sort of, you know, traveling salesperson. He's moved his way up from being a clerk and he wakes up and his first thought is not of, oh, look at, I've been turned into a bug, but rather, man, I better get to work because there's going to be a lot of problems if I don't show up. So, you know, he says, oh God, what an exhausting job I've picked on traveling about day in, day out. It's much more irritating work than doing the actual business in the office. And on top of that, there's the trouble of constant traveling, worrying about train connections, the bed and irregular meals, casual acquaintances that are always new and never become friends. The devil take it all. And why is he doing this? To provide for his family. And we read a little bit later, he says, um, here we go. If I didn't have to hold my hand about, you know, saying what was on his mind because of my parents, I'd have given notice long ago and I've gone to the chief and told him exactly what I think of him. Um, that's a, you know, uh, that would knock him endways. And he says, there's still hope. Once I've saved enough money to pay back my parents' debts to him, that should take another five or six years. I'll do it without fail. I'll cut myself completely loose then. For the moment, though, I'd better get up since my train goes at five. So the family is, at that point, seemingly completely dependent on Gregor. He is the breadwinner of the family. As a young, you know, fairly dynamic man who's willing to shoulder burdens that are the result of his, as we later find out, the failure of his father's business, um, he is now the person who has to earn for the rest of his family who are in debt. Uh, we find a little bit later in, in the discussion of you know, what's uh, going on. The clerk has shown up, the chief clerk, and wants to know where is Gregor? Why isn't he showing up? He says, what's the matter with you? You're barricading yourself in your room, causing your parents a lot of unnecessary trouble and neglecting neglecting your business duties in an incredible fashion, right? And Gregor is trying to communicate with him and he's unable to do so. And then he comes out as the bug and this leads to a catastrophe. The clerk flees the place. Gregor loses his job. He's lost the source for the family to have an actual income and the family are stuck in the flat with Gregor and don't really know what's going on, whether he's ever going to change back. His mother holds out hope, but we don't know about his father. The sister kind of steps up and takes over. She's young. She hasn't had any real responsibilities up until this point. They lose the cook because the cook can't bear to be there with them. They have to take over the cooking 
duties. And then we get a little bit further on into the story, Gregor's father explaining the, fa the family's financial position and prospects to both his mother and his sister. And not to Gregor. Gregor is just listening in on this. And so he says, this, the statement made by his father was the first cheerful information Gregor had heard since his imprisonment. He had been of the opinion nothing at all was left over from his father's business. At least his father had never said anything to the contrary. And of course, he'd not asked him directly. And what we're seeing here is Gregor's father has actually either deceived Gregor or just allowed Gregor to be deceived into thinking the family's finances were actually worse than they were and that Gregor had to keep a job that he doesn't like sacrificing so that his family could get out of a debt that they owe. So we, we see here, Gregor's sole desire was to do his utmost to help the family to forget as soon as possible the catastrophe that had overwhelmed the business and thrown them all into a state of complete despair. He'd set to work with unusual ardor and almost overnight had become a commercial traveler instead of a little clerk with much better chances of earning money and his success was immediately translated into good round coin which he could lay on the table for his amazed and happy family. And this, as we're going to find out, this is really great for Gregor. These had been fine times and they'd never recurred, at least not with the same sense of glory, Although later on, Gregor had earned so much money, he was able to meet the expenses of the entire household and had done so. They had simply got used to it, both the family and Gregor. The money was gratefully accepted and gladly given, but there was no special uprush of warm feeling. And he's got plans, you know, to send his sister to the conservatory. It may happen, may not. But you notice his family is kind of just accepting that Gregor is going to contribute, maybe even you could say taking him to some degree for granted. And now he's not an earner. He's not a producer. He's actually a burden to them. So we come back and we find out that the father, you know, repeats his explanations. And he says, a certain amount of investments, a very small amount of it was true survived the wreck of their fortunes, had an even increased a little bit because the dividends had never been touched. Besides that, the money Gregor brought home every month, he had kept only a few dollars for himself, had never been quite used up and now amounted to a small capital sum. So his father's been squirreling away this extra money, but it's not enough. Like he says, the capital was by no means sufficient to let the family live on the interest of it. For one year, perhaps, or at the most two, they could live on the principal. They have enough money to live on for two years. That was all. It was a sum that ought not to be touched and should be kept for a rainy day. Money for living expenses had to be earned. And this presents some serious challenges. His father was still hale enough, but an old man, and he'd done no work for the past five years and could not be expected to do much right? He'd actually become fat and sluggish. What about the mother? Well, how was she to earn a living with her asthma, which troubled her even when she walked through the flat and kept her lying on a sofa every other day, panting for breath beside an open window? Okay, so the parents, doesn't look like they're going to be able to earn much money. What about his sister? Was she to earn her bread? She, who was still a child of 17, whose life hitherto had been so pleasant, consisting as it did in dressing herself nicely, sleeping long, helping in the household, going out to a few modest entertainments, and above all, playing the violin. And, you know, it doesn't look like they have a lot of possibilities. And what do we find? Very interestingly, Gregor is listening to this. He is hot, as the story says, with shame and grief. Why? Because now the burden of earning money to stay afloat is being placed upon people who are less able to shoulder that burden. Gregor has been doing that in the past, but now, you know, after his transformation, not possible. So in fact, he has to be cared for at least to some degree. It doesn't cost much. They can provide him with rotting vegetables. And uh, it's not as if he you know, needs anything else other than time. 
So what is going to happen? Well, we see a transformation. And the first one that we hear about is essentially, I mean, we could say that Greta transforms, but not in the sense of the workplace. She's taking over more of the duties at home. She takes charge, of course, of Gregor, but we're going to find out later what she's actually doing outside of the house. Gregor's father is the first one that we hear about. And this is after Gregor, um, you know, is, is getting out and um, his father is uh, now a, a different sort of man. He was standing there in fine shape, dressed in a smart blue uniform with gold buttons, such as bank messengers wear. His strong double chin bulged over the stiff high collar of his jacket. From under his bushy eyebrows, his black eyes darted fresh and penetrating glances. His one-time tangled white hair had been combed flat on either side of a shining and carefully exact pairing. He pitched his cap, which bore a gold monogram, probably the badge of some rank, in a wide sweep across the whole room onto the sofa, and with the tail ends of his jacket thrown back, his hands in his trouser pockets advanced with a grim visage towards Gregor. Likely enough, he didn't know what he meant to do. And then he talks about lifting up his his shoes with giant soles. And Gregor thinks, oh, my dad, he's really got his energy back, and he's aggressive towards me now. He's not going to put up with any of what I'm doing, and everything I do is going to be looked on in the worst way. He's going to take as a piece of peculiar wickedness any excursion over the ceiling. So the, the father's dressed up in a uniform. He's working now. And what do we find out? Um, so they are now all working. Soon after supper, his father would fall asleep in his armchair. His mother and sister would admonish each other to be silent. Why is he falling asleep in the armchair? Because he's beat. He's tired, right? What is his mother doing? Stitched at fine sewing for an underwear firm. His sister, who had taken a job as a sales girl, was learning shorthand in French in the evenings on the chance of bettering herself. So all of them are rising to the occasion. Even the mother, who's asthmatic, can at least do sewing. And as it turns out, all three of them, as we find out, actually have employers. So, you know, they manage to take over. And this is a bit of a transformation on their part, we can say. Um, The family is... uh, going to take in some lodgers. We also see if the sister exhausted by her daily work had grown tired of looking after Gregor, as she did formerly, there was no need for his mother's intervention or Gregor being neglected at all. The Shar woman was there. They hire a cleaning lady, a temporary part-time cleaning lady, who actually forms quite an interesting semi-relationship with Gregor. But they take in three lodgers as well, three of them with full beards. They have a passion for order, uh, not only in their own room, but since they're now members of the household in all of its arrangements. And they find themselves having to cater to these kind of jerk people, as we're going to find out. So the family is figured things out. They, all three of them have jobs. They haven't touched the nest egg. They've got a cleaning lady. They've got these lodgers who are some trouble, but are bringing in income as well. And then Gregor breaks out again. And the lodgers, there's a confrontation between them and the father. Um, And what do we find out? Greta has come to a crisis moment herself. She says, my dear parents, things can't go on like this. Perhaps you don't realize that, but I do. I won't utter my brother's name in the presence of this creature. So all I can say is we must try to get rid of it. We've tried to look after it and put up with it as as far as humanly possible. I don't think anyone could reproach us in the slightest. She's more than right, said Gregor's father to himself. We must try to get rid of it, his sister now said explicitly to his father, since her mother was coughing too much to hear a word. It will be the death of you. I can see that coming. When one has to work as hard as we do, all of us, one can't stand this continual torment at home on top of it. At least I can't stand it any longer. So Greta is saying two really important things here. One is, this isn't Gregor. And she's going to go on to explain, if it really was Gregor, 
he would not put up with this sort of thing from this, this monster that we have. But this is killing us. This is sapping our energy. This is keeping us from being able to live the life that we ought to be able to live since we're all being productive. So, you know, they go back and forth about, well, if he could understand us. And Gregor's sister, Greta, says, he must go. That's the only solution, Father. You must try to get rid of the idea that this is Gregor. If this were him, he would have realized long ago, human beings can't live with such a creature. And he would, gone, he would have gone away on his own accord. Then we wouldn't have any brother, but we'd be able to go on living and keep his memory in honor. As it is, this creature persecutes us, drives away our lodgers, obviously wants the whole apartment to himself, and would have us all sleep in the gutter. So financial catastrophe, ruin. That's what she says the, the creature is threatening them with. And then shortly after this, Gregor dies. And what happens? Well, we find that, you know, the Shar woman discovers him dead and they are kind of, you know, depressed about this, trying to figure out what they're going to do, but they're also relieved. Mr. Samsa says, now thanks be to God. They feel a little, you know, sadness and regret because of how thin his body was. The lodgers come out looking for their breakfast. Mr. Samsa kicks them out. And then what ends up happening? They decided to spend this day in resting and going for a stroll. They not only deserved such a respite from work, but absolutely needed it. And so they sat down at the table and wrote three notes of excuse. Mr. Samsa to his board of management, his employers. Mrs. Samsa to her employer, stitching the, the underwear. And Greta to the head of her firm. The Shar woman comes in and says, well, I've gotten rid of the, the body. And after she leaves, the father says, we're going to fire her. I'll give her her notice uh, tonight. And then he says, um, let's go. Let, let's let bygones be bygones. And all three of them left the apartment together. They actually get to go outside. They're freed now, which was more than they had done for months and they went by tram into the open country outside the town. And they, we read that it was filled with warm sunshine. And then they began to discuss their prospects. It appeared upon closer inspection. These were not all that bad for the jobs that they had got, in which so far they had never really discussed with each other, were all three admirable and likely to lead to better things later on. The greatest immediate improvement in their condition would arise from moving to another house, getting out of that situation. They wanted to take a smaller and cheaper, but also better situated and more easily run apartment than the one they had, which Gregor had selected back when he was, so to speak, in charge, right? And they realized that, you know, Greta is now flowering into young womanhood and maybe it's time for her to get married, to find a a suitor. And all of this now becomes possible because Gregor is gone. They no longer have this, this monstrous vermin living within their lodgings that they can't afford to leave. They have freedom in the end and not just economic freedom or freedom to relocate, but a freedom to move into a brighter future as opposed to a future that had seemed very bleak for all of them. 